Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending, I think, on where you are. Um, my name is Jessica Cruz. I'm the Senior Pollinator Conservation Specialist um, with the Xerces Society. I work out of uh, Sacramento, California. And today we are going to be talking about getting to know the good bugs. Um, and obviously, good bugs is a very subjective term. And um, when I say good bugs, I think we're talking about from a human standpoint, particularly from an agricultural standpoint. And I'll talk more about that later. Um, just for those of you who don't know, the Xerces Society um, is an international nonprofit group. We work to protect biodiversity through the conservation of invertebrates um, and their habitats. Um, our motto is protecting the life that sustains us, um, which is really our way of saying um, that we need pollinators and other beneficial insects um, as much as they need us. <clears throat> so, the goal of today's um, webinar, um, first of all, I want to make it clear that this is not a taxonomy class. Um, that's just above and beyond what we could achieve in an hour and a half long webinar. Um, you know, people study ta taxonomy for many, many years um, and still don't know everything that's out there. Um, so, you know, this training won't necessarily allow you to go out to your garden or your farm and identify, you know, every insect that you see out there. However, what I hope this training will do is help people understand um, the really critical ecosystem services that beneficial insects provide um, and be able to recognize some of these major beneficial insect groups out in the landscape. Um, and it is my hope that with those two things um, that also people will be encouraged um, to adopt the practices that protect uh, these insect groups. Um, just in terms of nomenclature or terms, I will use the term beneficial insects um, quite a bit throughout this talk. That is an umbrella term, um, at least in the way that I'm using it, um, to include both pollinators. So pollinators are one major group of beneficial insects, and then also natural enemies, which is sort of another major group of beneficial insects that we'll talk about. Um, so these would be natural enemies of crop pests, so insects that um, prey upon other insects. Um, so I just wanted to make sure I define those terms so that people aren't confusing or confused. So again, beneficial insect is an umbrella term for both pollinators and natural enemies in the way that I'm using that term. Um, so just for an outline, just so you can all kind of get a sense of where we're going today and what we're going to be talking about, um, we are going to start with talking about bees specifically. Bees are um, a major focus when we're talking about pollinators. Um, they're definitely the, our most significant, um, effective and efficient pollinators. So we'll talk about bees. We'll talk about some of the common morphological characteristics of bees that will help you recognize them. Um, and also we will focus in a little bit on differentiating bees from flies and wasps because there are a lot of lookalikes in those three insect groups. Um, and I hope at a minimum from this webinar, you'll be able to kind of differentiate between those three broad groups and understand why it matters, um, you know, what you're looking at and which is which. Um, and then we're going to actually telescope in a little bit more um, and look at bees specifically. And I'm going to help give some tips so that you can differentiate uh, a native bee from a honeybee, which is the honeybees are introduced species. Um, whereas native bees are, you know, uh, are native to, you know, whatever area that you might be living in, and they're usually wild. Um, and we'll talk about, again, why it might matter to differentiate between those two groups of bees. Um, and then after that, we're going to shift focus a little bit and talk about natural enemies. And I want to make it clear that natural enemies is a very big group. Um, and so we won't be necessarily covering all natural enemies that might be out there. Instead, we're going to focus on a couple of specific ones that are pretty easy to recognize and pretty widespread um, and really have a potential to impact um, ecosystem or provide ecosystem services in terms of natural pest control. And then we're going to end with talking about um, scouting. Um, there's a specific scouting protocol that um, I'll kind of be following and Liz can put the link to that scouting protocol um, up in the um, chat box so that you can access it. Um, 
and we'll kind of loosely be following along, but I definitely encourage people to um, look at that scouting protocol on their own too after this training if it's something they're interested in using. So let's dive right in and talk about bees. Um, what is this insect? Is this a bee? Is it a fly? Is it a wasp? How do we know? First of all, um, not only how will we know, but why does it matter? Um, I think the reason that we really want to differentiate between bees and some of these other insects, if we're talking about working landscapes um, or even natural landscapes, is that bees are by, by far our most important pollinator. So in our natural ecosystems, um, they are pollinating plants, which allows them to produce seed um, and, and to um, uh, regenerate um, or reproduce. Um, in agricultural systems or agroecosystems, um, in a lot of cases, in order for uh, a crop to um, bear fruit or nuts or whatever the final product is, that plant also needs to be pollinated, um, again, usually by an insect, and these are by far our most effective and efficient pollinators. So that's why we wanna differentiate bees from these other insects, because we really wanna know what's out there providing um, pollination services versus other services that insects provide. So in order to talk about how to recognize bees in the landscape, I'm actually going to start by telling you how not um, or what not to rely on if you're trying to figure out if something is a bee or not. Um, so for example, um, color um, and size to some extent, but especially color or striping is not a good way to identify a bee. So this insect that I just showed, we call that a bee mimic. Um, it is not a bee. It is actually a fly. Um, so just looking at something um, like striping is not necessarily going to help you identify a bee. And in fact, bees come in all of these different colors and um, you know stripes. And we've got you know everything from metallic green to kind of a you know a dull black. We've got bees that have different types of striping or stripes in different parts of their bodies. Um, so, you know, there's huge diversity when it comes to uh, the coloration of a bee. And so just looking at that alone um, is not really going to help you because there's so much diversity. There's also a lot of variation in size and shape of bees. So if you look at this photo right here, what you're looking at is this is the face of one of our largest known bee species, just the head, just the face. Um, and this is one of our smallest um, known bee species. So you can see, obviously, there's a lot of variation in size. What might be helpful, though, for you, just for context, um, for you to think about is that honeybees really fall right about in the middle of sort of this, you know, variance in size. Uh, honeybees are just considered medium. Um, so that may kind of help you for context. Um, similar, similarly, bees can be, you know, fairly slender like this bee, or they can be a little bit more round and robust. Um, so there's, you know, a fair amount of variation in the actual um, shape of the bee as well. Um, so again, those were the things that basically, you know, coloration and size specifically aren't going to help you. But these are the characteristics that will help you. These are the things that you want to hone in on if you're looking at an insect and trying to figure out, is that a bee or is it something else? <clears throat> so I'm going to kind of start here. I'm going to work around clockwise um, to help you um, kind of follow along. So first and foremost, um, bees are usually hairy. They can be hairy in different parts of their body, but somewhere in their body, they usually have um, thick, Either, either velvety or um, you know mat, like thick um, hair that you should be able to see with your naked eye if you look closely. Um, and that is because bees um, transport, they actively transport pollen um, and the hair on their bodies helps them do that. That helps the pollen stick onto their bodies. And so that's why they have morph morphologically evolved to have hair is to help them um, with carrying pollen. Um, so that is one feature that's very common in bees and um, again will help you with identification. Um, another thing to look at um, if you're trying to figure out if you're looking at a bee or not is to look at their eyes. Um, bees eyes tend to be kind of toward the side of their head so sort of widely spaced. 
Um, particularly, this will help you if you're trying to figure out if it's a bee or a fly, um, because as you'll see, I'll show you a slide of a fly in a little bit, fly's eyes tend to be very close together, um, and bees are more spread apart, again, on the sides of their faces. Um, bees also tend to have very long antenna, um, and even in a very small bee, if you can get a good enough look at it, you can see the, those antenna um, with your naked eye. Whereas again, as compared to flies, flies tend to have very short stubby antenna. Um, so if you're trying to figure out is that a bee or a fly that I'm looking at, looking at the antenna is gonna help you um, as well. Um, pollen, this is a dead giveaway. Um, females, so you know, male bees do not transport pollen, but female bees do. So if you see a large load of pollen, like this is obviously this leg here, it's covered in pollen. Um, bees will either carry the pollen on their rear legs like this. Um, most bees do. Some bees will carry pollen on their abdomen. I'll show you what that looks like in another slide. Um, but it's either going to be on the leg or abdomen, and it's going to be a, a pretty sizable lump of pollen. And that is a definite indicator um, that you're looking at a bee. Bees also tend to have uh, rounder bodies um, as compared to, um, especially as compared to wasps. So I'll show you a wasp slide in a little bit. Um, and so that will also help you. And finally, bees have four wings, um, whereas flies have two wings. I will say that it is very hard to tell. I mean, you can see these wings are folded back and you can't, that looks like two wings. It's really hard to tell that there's four. So this won't really help you if you're trying to identify an insect out flying around, but it is just something that's good to know. Um, one note about pollen, as I mentioned, only females carry pollen, um, males do not. So just because it's not carrying pollen, that doesn't necessarily mean it is not a bee. Um, but again, if you see a lump of pollen, that's a pretty much of a dead giveaway. Um, I also wanted to mention that um, bees can carry their pollen wet. So this is an example of wet pollen. It looks like a big sort of chunk of resin. Um, or bees can also carry pollen dry. So if you look at this bee, can see sort of pollen on its leg. Or this last bee, you can see some uh, pollen on, this is a, an example of a bee that carries its pollen on its abdomen. So again, it can carry it in different parts of the body. Bees can carry pollen wet or dry, um, but female bees will almost always be seen transporting pollen. Um, also, as I mentioned, I talked about bees generally being hairy. And just a reminder that they can be hairy in different parts of their body. So you do need to look a little bit closely. Um, you know, bumblebees are the most obvious example. The hair is very fuzzy, it's sort of all over the body. Um, so that one's fairly easy. Um, but, you know, some of it, this is a, um, uh, one of our sweat bees, and they do appear pretty shiny. It's hard to see the hair until you look a little bit more closely. Um, so sometimes, you know, sometimes it's easy to get fooled. Um, so you do have to look closely, but this bee does, this is, bee is hairy. Um, and then this is a bee, again, this is an example of the, the bee that carries its pollen on its abdomen. This is one of our leaf cutter bees. Um, and you can see that um, the pollen is on the abdomen and that's where most of the hair is on this bee too, is on its abdomen. So um, let's talk about recognizing these bee lookalikes in the world of um, wasps and flies. There are um, a lot of bee mimics. There are a lot of bee lookalikes. Um, so I'm going to try to give you some pointers, again, how to differentiate uh, a bee from a wasp or a fly. Um, so this is a picture of a, a fly. Um, and this is actually, it's a serpid fly. It's also called a flower fly. Um, it is well known to be a bee mimic. Um, so it's a kind of a good one to look at um, in order to try to help you differentiate. So again, we're just going to kind of go clockwise around the slide here. Um, flies have two wings, as I mentioned earlier. Really hard to, to count those wings because they're, you know, clear and iridescent and they're usually folded. Um, so won't really help you with visual ID, but it's just a good thing to, something good to know. Um, flies are generally not very hairy. Again, they're not evolved to carry pollen, so the hair doesn't serve that function. They will sometimes have some shorter kind of bristly hairs, but you won't see those really, you won't see flies looking, usually, you won't see flies looking very fuzzy, 
um, or um, you know, with dense brushes of, of velvety hair. That is not something that you generally will see on a fly. Um, flies often have, it's a little hard to see in this slide, but they often have these long spindly legs. So again, I mentioned a lot of bees carry pollen on their rear legs um, in a corbicula is the apparatus um, that um, it, that's the name for their pollen carrying apparatus. Um, flies don't have that. And so that their legs tend to be um, much skinnier, um, kind of spindly as a pair, as, a, as compared to a bee's leg, because um, they don't need to carry pollen. So they don't, they don't have um, corbicula. Um, likewise, you will see very little pollen on a fly. Sometimes, you know, they're, they're, they visit flowers to drink the nectar. Um, and sometimes they will get pollen stuck on their body. So it's, you know, it's possible there'll be some pollen on them, but you won't see those large loads of pollen that you would see on a female bee. Um, and then again, I talked about the eyes on a bee being more on the side of their head. Um, flies eyes are much uh, closer together toward the front of the head. They're often almost touching like this. So if you can get a good look at, at, at this insect's eyes, that will really help you differentiate. And finally, flies have these very short, thick antenna. You can see right here, much shorter than a bee's, generally almost impossible to see with a naked eye, especially on a smaller fly because the antenna is so small. So if you're looking at an insect foraging and you can actually visually see the antenna, probably a bee as opposed to a fly. And then wasps are another insect group um, that is often confused uh, with bees. Um, they are closely related, but they are different insects. And again, they serve different functions in our ecosystems. Um, wasps, I mean, body shape is probably the easiest way to differentiate a wasp from a bee. Um, people describe wasps as looking tough. Um, they have narrower bodies than bees, and they have this very, very pinched abdomen right here. So again, this is, um, this is the abdomen right here, and this is the thorax, and that place where the abdomen and thorax come together um, on a wasp is very, we call it narrow-waisted, it's very pinched. So that body shape will really help you. Um, even the more slender bees, tend to be a little bit more robust than a wasp and don't have this like extremely pinched waist that a wasp will have. Other characteristics, um, wasps have four wings like bees. Um, again, pretty hard to see, but good to know. Um, another thing that I think will be helpful and it takes a little bit more training with the eye, but this is something that's really um, helpful with identification is that the coloration on a wasp is on their exoskeleton, whereas the coloration on a bee is actually made up of color, different colored hair. So what this means is that wasps tend to be much shinier. So if you're thinking about it like paint, um, a wasp would be gloss, whereas a bee would be matte. Um, and if you look really closely at the striping of a bee, if you can get a close enough look, you can actually see the hairs that make up that coloration. Um, whereas on the wasp, that coloration is the exoskeleton, comes across as much more shiny. Um, like flies, wasps don't need to transport pollen. It's not, um, you know, it's not something that they need to do. And so you won't see those big pollen loads um, on their legs and they won't have, you know, their legs are generally more slender um, than a bee leg. Um, and again, wasps also, because they don't need to carry pollen, haven't evolved to be very hairy. So there's, they're generally not very much hair on a wasp. Um, so that is kind of the general outline of how to differentiate uh, a bee from a fly or a wasp um, and how to sort of recognize a bee if you're out in the landscape looking at insects, trying to figure out what you're looking at. Um, now I wanna dive in a little deeper and talk about how to differentiate a honeybee um, from a native bee. Um, and also kind of talk about why it matters. Um, and it, it matters because honeybees and native bees give us very different information um, about the landscape that they're in. Most honeybees that we see out in the landscape actually are not wild. Most of them are from a managed hive somewhere, maybe your neighbor, maybe the farm next door, depending on where you are. 
There are some wild honeybees, of course, but most of them that you see are actually are from a managed hive. So their populations can fluctuate really dramatically because hives get moved around quite a bit. Um, native bees are much more sort of stationary. Uh, they tend to nest and forage much more kind of in the same general area. Um, so looking for native bees in a landscape tells us a lot more about the quality of that landscape or the quality of that habitat um, than, than honeybee populations do. Native bees can indicate a lot more about the habitat than honeybees. So how do you differentiate a um, native bee from a honeybee? The easiest way is to look for some very specific characteristics um, of honeybees. Um, and I think that that will help. So if you're looking at an insect, your first step would be, okay, is it a bee or a fly or a wasp? And if you're pretty confident it's a bee, um, you know, you've looked at the antenna, you've looked at the legs, you look for hair, pollen. Um, once you're like, okay, I think this is a bee, the next step would be like, well, is it a honeybee or is it a native bee? Um, so characteristics of honeybees, again, I mentioned they're kind of medium size in the, in the sort of realm of, of, of bee sizes. Um, they do have striped abdomen. So this is a kind of classic looking um, bee with a striped abdomen. It is important to keep in mind that there's a lot of color variation within honeybees. So even though they always have striped abdomen, as you can see with these two bees, it can be a very light golden color striping, pretty subtle, or it can even be this much darker, darker um, sort of black and cream color um, and not a whole lot of that amber. So there is variation, but they do have striped abdomens. Um, the females carry their pollen moist on their hind leg. So right here, there's a big lump of nice moist pollen. It looks kind of resiny, a little bit shiny when you look at it. The only other type of native bee that you're likely to see that carries their pollen wet is a, is a bumblebee. And I think bumblebees look enough different from a honeybee that if you see that lump of wet pollen, that's really gonna help you because um, you've already narrowed it down to one of two. <laughs> um, so really keep an eye out. Um, and again, just keep in mind, it's not always gonna work because male bees don't carry pollen, um, but it will help you. Um, honeybees also have a hairy thorax and a relatively smooth looking abdomen. Um, so, you know, obviously there's hair on the abdomen. Abdomen, I already told you the coloration is made up of hairs, but they're very short. But if you look at the thorax right here, you can see on honeybee, very fuzzy thorax, and that is definitely a uh, characteristic of a honeybee. And finally, I think one of the, um, once it takes a while to train your eye to this, but once you do, I think it's really helpful is to look at the shape of the abdomen of a honeybee, and it's what we call torpedo shaped. So you can kind of see this abdomen, and it comes down to this little sort of tip right here, sort of like a torpedo. That is a very characteristic shape. Um, and fairly unique shape um, of a honeybee. So if you can get a good look at the abdomen and it's got that kind of torpedo shape, you are probably looking at a honeybee. Aha. So now it's time for our quiz. And I will say it's a quiz in quotation marks. It's just for fun. Um, but I would like, Liz is gonna launch the quiz for us. I would like you to look at these four different insects on this slide, 4A through 4D. And for each of these insects, um, you are going to determine, take your best guess, um, are you looking at a wasp, at a honeybee, at a fly, or at a native bee? Um, I just realized that there's a mistake in this first question. It says a bumblebee. It should say, uh, honey, and it should say native bee. So your choices will always be wasp, honeybee, fly, or native bee. Um, so I'll just give you a couple minutes to kind of take a look. Again, look at the antenna, look at the legs, um, look at the, um, look for pollen, uh, look to see where hair is on the body, um, look at the shape of abdomen, all of those. Give it just a 
couple more minutes here for people to think about it. Looks like people are doing really well though. Um, let's see what else can you look at. Look at the eyes. Are they toward the front of the head or the side of the head? Um, does the abdomen look very pinched? Do the legs look spindly uh, or thicker? Are they carrying pollen? We'll give about 15 more seconds on the poll there. So go ahead and get your answers in if you're still working on it. And no worries if you don't complete it. It's just a little activity to practice what Jess has taught us all already. Just for fun. And if you don't know, give it your best guess. I'm going to give you the answers in just a minute. So we can talk about that. All right, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up polling. Thanks, everybody, for participating there. All right, you guys did great. I'm just kind of scanning over the results here. And I think um, a vast majority of you got the answers correct. So I'm going to go ahead and advance to the next slide. Um, so that's always encouraging with people. And, you know, I should also say that when I do this, this type of training, it's usually uh, accompanied by some time in the field where we can go out and actually look at real life insects together and, and lean over people's shoulders and try to answer questions. So it's a lot harder to do this via a webinar. Um, so y'all, we're doing great. Um, but I'm having trouble advancing my, oh, there we go. Sorry, I was trying to advance my slide and it stuck. Okay, so um, 4A is a loss. Um, and again, just looking at things like body shape, um, it's a little hard to see on this one, but it's a very pinched abdomen. Um, it's very um, narrow um, insects. Uh, pretty shiny. Um, so all of those things will help you identify it as a wasp. This one is a honeybee. Um, again, just the shape of that abdomen there, that kind of torpedo shaped abdomen, the very fuzzy thorax. Um, this one, you can't really see the pollen on the body, but you can see this really um, thickened rear leg um, for pollen, uh, for carrying pollen, the corbicula. 4C is a fly. Um, I think the most obvious for this one is you can see that the eyes are very close together and they're almost meeting. Um, and the antenna, you can't really see them because they're pretty short and stubby. Um, so it's really hard to see that. Um, and again, they're not very, this is not very hairy, right? It's pretty shiny, not a lot of hair on the body. So all of those will help you determine if it's a fly. And then this guy is a native bee. Um, it does look a little shiny and it is fairly slender. So it's a bit tricky. Um, but you can tell that it's not a fly because you can see it's pretty long antenna. So that really helps you. Um, and it's definitely not quite as slender um, or as shiny as a wasp. Um, and if you look closely, I know it's hard to see on this photograph, but there is pollen on the body um, of this insect. Um, so, um, so it is a native bee. In fact, it's a, um, a green sweat bee. Um, and all of these insects do visit flowers. So wasps and flies are visiting flowers for the nectar resources, and bees can be visiting for either pollen or nectar. Um, so you will see them all visiting flowers um, and the behavior between pollen gathering and nectar drinking. There's a little bit of difference if, you're, if your eye is really well trained, but it's hard to tell which thing they're doing and they don't sit still for very long, so. All right, well, you guys did great with that kind of identif identification and differentiation uh, between these different insect groups. So that is fantastic. Um, I feel confident that we're ready to move on to part two of this training, as it were, um, which is to talk about these natural enemies. So to talk about this other group of um, beneficial insects. And again, beneficial to people in their, you know, um, production systems or their um, ecosystems. Um, so. All of these natural enemies have incredible value in agriculture um, or gardening. Um, they provide incredibly useful ecosystem services by consuming lots and lots of pest insects. Um, so they're really great to have around, which is why we want to look for them, right, and see if they're if they're out there uh, in the environment. 
when we're talking about beneficial insects, and today we're kind of going to be talking about all these different groups, um, we're going to talk first about the predators. And so these are insects that directly prey on pests. They catch them and consume them directly. Um, and they tend to be generalists. They tend to eat a lot of different types of, um, of prey, of, of insects. Then we're going to talk about parasitoids. Um, parasitoids are insects that lay their eggs either inside or on top of the body of their host. And when those eggs hatch, it's actually the larva um, that will consume the host. And so that's kind of a special different group of beneficial. They tend to be specialists for almost every pest insect out there. There is a, paras a parasitoid that will attack it. Um, so it can be a very targeted method of pest control. There are also lots of non-insects that provide a better natural enemies of crop pests. We're not going to talk about all of them, but we will talk about spiders just because they are, provide such great pest control and they tend to be really ubiquitous in the landscape. Um, and people have a little bit of a fear of spiders sometimes, so it's nice to know that they can be very beneficial to have around. Um, and then also, I want to just recognize that Flies and wasps and even beetles can be pollinators. Um, they, while they're visiting insects for um, the, to drink the nectar, pollen can get stuck to their body, which they can then inadvertently, you know, transport and track around. So they can be pollinators, but again, they're much less effective because they're not actually gathering pollen actively. It's more incidental, if that makes sense. So the insects that I'm about to talk about are featured in the Beneficial Insect Scouting Guide um, um, that, we're, that we ch shared that link with you. Um, and I wanna just let people know that what this tells us is it tells us a lot about the quality of the habitat and the potential for ecosystem services, but it doesn't necessarily tell us the degree of ecosystem services. We just don't have that kind of data. So a lot of times people ask like, well, how many beneficials is good? Or, you know, how many do I need to control my pest populations? And, you know, we, we don't really have that data per se, but we certainly know um, that large robust populations of natural enemies can greatly um, reduce uh, uh, pest pressure. So they can be very effective. Um, I do want to let people know that we will allow time at the end, lots of time for Q&A at the end of this presentation. Um, so if you have questions, definitely put them um, in the um, Q&A box and we will try to get to everyone's questions um, if possible, if time allows. Um, so, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Okay, so let's talk first about our predatory beneficial insects. So these are insects that directly hunt or consume their prey. Um, as I mentioned, they're usually generalists um, and they, what we call ravenously feed. So they tend to eat a lot um, and predator diversity can be very high in well-managed systems. So when I've visited farms that have lots of natural habitat and are maybe have a lot like high crop diversity and are very judicious about their pesticide use, um, we can see very large populations of these predatory insects um, contributing significantly to, to pest control. The first um, generalist that I want to talk about um, that is in the scouting guide is the minute pirate bug. We like to refer to them as tiny but mighty because they are very, very small. Um, they are predaceous both as um, nymphs, as you see here in their immature stage, and also as adults. Um, so they, for throughout their life cycle, are feeding on other insects. They generally, because they're very small, they generally prey on smaller insects, but they can um, go after um, small caterpillars and they definitely go after aphids. So in terms of identification, um, the protocol that we use actually just focuses on the adult. Um, and that's just because the nymphs are hard to see, they're hard to find, and they're a little bit hard to differentiate from other insects. So I would recommend focusing on the adult. You might need a hand lens because they are very small. But if you look at this adult, I look for what I refer to as the three black diamonds or three black triangles. So there's this, uh, there's this one on the thorax right here. 
And then on the tips of their wings, there's two more black triangles. Um, and that is offset um, by sort of a cream or white color. So again, these three black triangles, if you look at it, if you see an insect that's small, very small, two to five millimeters, kind of oval shaped with those particular markings, it's very likely that you're looking at a minute pirate bug. So that will really help you uh, with identification. Another group of amazing predators are um, the lace wings. It's a large family with a lot of genera. Um, lace wings are particularly known for eating, um, for being voracious in their appetite. They can consume over 400 aphids uh, in a week. The adults um, feed primarily on nectar or pollen. So it's the immature stage, it's the larva that are predatory. They often overwinter in leaf litter or under bark, and they also tend to be cool. They can be active in cooler weather um, as compared to other predators. These are often earliest season predators that I will see um, out in the landscape. So for me in California, I'm, I'm seeing them out and about right now um, with their numbers really increasing um, pretty uh, rapidly. So they're usually one of the first natural enemies that I'll see out in the springtime. Um, in terms of monitoring, we actually look for both the adults and the larva because they, they are both fairly easy to see in the landscape. They're pretty easy to recognize. The adults are this bright green color with these kind of cool iridescent looking wings um, and very long antenna. Um, and they're, you know, about maybe half an inch or so in size. So, you know, they're pretty easy to, to spot in the landscape. The larva, I refer to, um, I refer to the larva as looking like a small alligator, baby alligator. <laughs> um, they're kind of elongate. Um, they have these, these pinchers um, on the uh, a front of their bodies here that they use for um, catching and consuming prey. It can be a little hard to see with the naked eye, but you can, if you can get a close enough look, or if you have a hand lens, you can see that. Um, and they've got six legs, right? So if you see an insect like this, like a little baby alligator crawling around in your foliage, um, that's what you're looking at. You're looking at an immature lace wing and they're great to have around. Lady beetles, um, I think this is probably an insect group that most of you know. Um, they are predatory during all of their life stages. So again, both as um, larvae and as adults, they um, are consuming other insects. Um, even though they are generalists, different groups, different types of lady beetle do have different types of um, insect preferences. So for example, there's a type of lady beetle called the mealy bug destroyer. And as the name suggests, they love mealy bugs. Um, almost all aphids will go after mites as well. Sometimes they'll go after scale, white flies, um, other soft-bodied insects. They'll prey on the eggs of other insects. So they're really, really good natural predators to have around. They tend to overwinter under vegetation or bark. Um, and they also, like here in California, they will overwinter under bunch grasses. They seem to really love deer grass in particular. So that's a, a good um, thing to provide for them if you want to keep them around. Um, I think for identification, you know, I think most people can recognize what a lady beetle looks like, but you know, they're round, they can be round to oval, they can be orange or red or anywhere sort of in between. Um, they almost always have black spots, but they can have many spots or very few spots. Um, the spots can be very even or they can be very uneven, completely depends on the species. Um, so don't get too hung up in that. Um, the protocol does involve looking both for the adult here as well as for the larva. Um, kind of like the lace wing, lady beetle larva um, are like little, they kind of have alligator shaped bodies, um, but lady beetle larva um, are black. And then they have these really distinct, see these two orange stripes right there on either side of their body. Um, that is a really good indicator. Look for those two orange stripes. You see a little something crawling around that looks like a teeny, teeny, tiny little baby alligator with six legs. Look for those, uh, look for that black body with the orange stripes and that's what you're looking at. You're looking at the lady beetle larva. Uh -huh. The serpent fly, I mentioned serpent flies earlier. We were talking about differentiating serpent flies from bees. Um, and it is important to know that actually serpent flies 
can be pretty decent pollinators. They just happen to transport pollen inadvertently a lot. Um, again, though, they're just visiting flowers for, for drinking the nectar. Um, but they're great natural enemies. Um, as adults, they only feed on flowers um, or on nectar. Um, but in their immature stage, they consume lots of other insects. Um, they can, again, they can eat a single larva um, of a serpent fly, can eat hundreds of aphids in a week. Um, they overwinter in um, sort of leaf litter or like down in the soil. So if you notice for a lot of these insect groups, I mentioned they, they overwinter in leaf litter or in bark or, so it's good to have some areas in your farm or garden um, that are undisturbed where you can kind of leave piles of leaves or some logs, things like that, because so many of these beneficial, that's where they shelter and that's where they overwinter. So that's something to think about. In terms of identification, um, the protocol um, that we use actually focuses in only on the adults because the larva can just be really hard to find. The larvae are very small um, and kind of cryptic and they move around, they move really fast, so it can be hard to see them. Um, so we focus just on looking for the adults um, and usually where there's an adult, there's probably a larva there. Um, so the adults are what we refer to as bee mimics. They always have this yellow and black striping that's totally indicative um, of a flower fly or, um, sorry, a serpent fly. Um, they can vary in size from pretty small to pretty large because there's a lot of different species, um, but they tend to be kind of slender and hairless. Um, and again, looking at that striping, um, the really good way to know if you're looking at a, um, at a flower fly or serpent fly. Our other group of common predators would be our predatory wasps. Um, so a lot of people don't know this, but most or many wasps are predaceous. Um, the adult females will actually go out and hunt down prey, not for themselves, but to feed their larva. So they'll be out in the landscape hunting down prey. They will bring the prey back to their larva um, to eat because um, their larvae are mostly carnivorous. Um, so they're actually really good natural enemies to have around, even though people don't always love wasps. Um, we kind of talked about how to identify or differentiate a bee from a fly or a wasp um, previously. So um, just knowing that wasps are good natural enemies is, um, I think once you've identified something as a wasp, you don't have to dismiss it as you know unimportant. It can actually really be a um, really good natural enemy to have around. Um, they can be either solitary or semi-social. Um, they tend to nest down in the ground um, or in cavities, sometimes in plant stems or um, even like the paper wasps um, that kind of build their own nests. Um, they prey on a lot of different things, but they are particularly well known for preying on caterpillars. So they're really good to have around if you have Lepidoptera uh, pests. Spiders, um, again, Technically speaking, spiders are not insects, um, but they are invertebrates and they are really good natural enemies. So we do include them um, again in our monitoring protocol because they can be such good natural enemies. And they also move into an area really quickly. You can get really high populations of spiders um, in, in a habitat area um, pretty quickly. So it, it's, it's good to have, you know, it's good to know that they're out there. Um, they are predatory both as immature and mature stages. Um, they can live in a lot of different places depending on the type of um, spider we're talking about. So they can be orb weavers or wolf spiders, jumping spiders, they can live up in the crop canopy, they can build webs or they can live down in the soil. There's a whole lot of variation. Um, but you know, basically for identification, um, that two segmented body that's you know usually fairly round or oval, and then of course eight legs right, as opposed to um, the true insect that has six legs, spiders uh, on a whole different um, order, uh, spiders will have eight legs. So that will help you with identification. And then last, I wanna talk about our really cool parasitic wasps or parasitoid wasps that I mentioned earlier. Um, and there are other insects that are, are um, can be parasitoids, but we're just focusing in on the parasitoid wasps because they're the biggest group um, and they have probably a lot of, probably the most number of um, 
uh, wasps that will feed on um, pest insects. So a, parasit a parasitic, parasitic wasp, sorry, will lay its egg either inside the body of its host. So you can see right there, this female is actually laying, she has a little piercing mechanism that she uses when she oviposits to lay her egg inside the body of the host right here. Um, some of them will also, this is a, actually a caterpillar that's covered in parasitic wasp eggs. So some of them will also lay their eggs on top of the body of the host. Either way, those eggs will hatch and those larvae will actually consume the insect either from the inside out or in the case of this caterpillar that just start munching right on that insect that, um, that they're born onto. Um, parasitic wasps are usually host specific, so it can be a really targeted way um, to do pest control. Um, and there is incredible diversity. As I think I mentioned earlier, for almost every insect out there, there is a known parasitic wasp that preys on them. They can be very hard to see, the parasitic wasps. Um, you can see in the slide, this is a wasp, a parasitic wasp right here. They're teeny, teeny, tiny. I mean, this is a leaf uh, with aphids on it, and this wasp is smaller than an aphid. So we don't look for the wasps themselves in our protocol just because they're hard to find. But what we look for is their evidence. So when a wasp, and we're limiting this just specifically to aphids because it's the easiest thing to recognize, and it's a very common pest. But when a wasp parasitizes an aphid, um, this is a case where the egg is laid inside the body of the aphid. When that egg hatches, they kind of consume the body of the aphid from the inside out and just leave this empty shell. So right here, and that sometimes the aphid kind of swells up and gets bloated in that process. So you can see these are normal aphids. They're all kind of plump and juicy and shiny. And then this is a parasitized aphid. It's nothing but like a hollow shell, totally different color. Um, if you look really closely, you can actually see an exit hole because once um, that parasitic wasp is hatches and is done consuming that aphid, they actually chew their way out. So you'll see um, little tiny exit holes. So if you look, turn over a leaf, if you have an aphid outbreak and look at the leaf, if you see um, these kind of different looking aphids, right, that just look like these kind of hollow shells that probably means you've got parasitic wasps around that are parasitizing your aphid, and that is a good thing. All right, so we're going to move into sort of the last part of our talk today. So we talked about how to recognize bees and differentiate them from flies and wasps. We talked about differentiating a honeybee from a native bee. And then we talked about all these other, um, a bunch of other natural enemies that you should be able to find somewhere out on the landscape. They're pretty common, but like I said, they, they're pretty widespread. Um, and so now I wanna talk specifically about this monitoring protocol that we work with. And there's lots of other monitoring protocols out there you definitely don't have to use, you know, the Xerces model. I'm certainly not suggesting that. Um, but it's, I think a lot of people who are serious about wanting to do this scouting um, find it really helpful to have a specific protocol to follow. Um, and so that's what is the intent um, of, of this, of introducing you and, and talking about this protocol, just to provide people with the tools if they want to go out there and use them. So just a little background on this protocol. In terms of the bee monitoring component, um, a number of years ago, Xerces um, teamed up with a bunch of different scientists from UC Davis and UC Berkeley, Rutgers, um, and Michigan State. It was a project that was funded by the NRCS. And what we wanted to do is find out if observational data can be can give us good, solid information. So it's sort of a community science type of project. So Usually when people are, are trying to look at insect populations, they will actually net the insects, put them in a kill jar, take them back to the lab, pin them, um, try to identify them out to the species level. It can be very time consuming. Um, you know, you also end up inadvertently killing a lot of insects in that process. Um, it can be really expensive. And so we wanted to know if we just get observational data, if we're just looking at insects visiting flowers using this kind of protocol and just lumping them into these pretty broad course groups, um, you know, honeybee, native bee, fly, wasp, et cetera. Um, are we getting valid data? 
And so we, we ran the study, we did some comparisons with a sort of more community science way of monitoring versus a more scientifically um, traditional way of monitoring. And what we found out was that this observational data, this kind of community science type of data was almost as accurate um, as the more traditional sort of netting and keying species out, at least for getting that course level data, right? For, for being able to differentiate bees from other in, insects and differentiate between honeybees and native bees. Um, we, we found out this observational data, just a little bit of training is really reliable and can give us kind of the same information um, about just generally speaking, at least about wild bee abundance and diversity. So then we wanted to take that model and bring it to these natural enemies, right? And talk about all these, um, you know, different predators and parasitic um, insects. We wanted to know if the same held true. Well, unfortunately, we have not been able to do that same type of study. So we don't know with these beneficial, with the natural enemies, we don't know if it's the same as with bees, as, you know, if the observational data can give us as much information. Um, we're going to do more work. We're going to, you know, try to, to get that figured out. But I just want to make sure that people are clear that we don't have as much data behind this part of the monitoring protocol. Um, and that the insects we chose, we chose because they're easy to recognize and they're widely distributed and they have um, high potential to contribute to ecosystem services. So what this protocol does specifically for the natural enemies is it provides information about the quality of habitat, um, and it can assess insect population changes over time. So it can give you, um, for example, pre, like if you make a change, like you create, you plant some insectary habitat or you change your pesticide use and you wanna know if your natural enemy populations are changing, it can be really good for that sort of pre and post project to see differences over time. And certainly tells you a lot about the potential for these insects to contribute. Uh, to natural um, pest control. So I'm just going to um, run over the scouting guide really quickly. We're not going to go into a lot of detail. Um, if you want to, like the guide has lots of information and it kind of lays everything out for you step by step. But I do just want to kind of explain what's in it. And so people can think about whether or not it's something that might be useful for them to use. Um, so again, here's the, the link to that guide. Um, down at the bottom of the slide here. So there are three main components um, to this monitoring protocol. The first one is a floral observation. What's important about this one is to realize that what you're doing is you are looking at the flowers and looking at what is visiting the flowers. Um, what you're not doing is trying to identify insects on the wing, which is what people often want to do. They see something flying around, they want to track it with their eye while it's flying. That's really hard to do. So this protocol involves setting up transect and doing a timed walk along the transect where you're looking at flowers and you're seeing what's visiting them and trying to determine what you're looking at. Um, that's how that um, protocol works, basically. There's really specific instructions in the guide, how long a transect or how many transects, how much time you should spend walking the transect, um, what time of year, um, the weather, all of those things are really important to make sure that you're getting good solid data. You wanna make sure you're looking at the right time, you know, when insects would be expected to be out and active. Um, and so that's also important. Um, it provides a lot of helpful tips, um, things like, you know, making sure that your shadow is behind you when you're walking a transect, because if your shadow is in front of you, the second your shadow falls on a flower, all the insects are gonna fly away. So things like that, that are just really helpful to know about, you know, just how to monitor um, and how to troubleshoot and kind of make sure you're getting the best kind of data. Um, and there's even these data sheets. Um, so if you want to, track your data, the most useful thing is, you know, for you to be able to compare either pre and post project data um, or use a control site, which I'll talk about more in a moment. Um, and it has the specific insects that you're looking for. So for floral monitoring, we're obviously only looking for insects that visit flowers, um, either for pollen or nectar. And so those are the specific insects that are included in this protocol that you'll be looking for, both pollinators and natural enemies. Um, and all of the, they're all from 
the previous slides that we just talked about. So wasps, lady beetles, serpent flies, et cetera. Um, the other part, the second part of this protocol is what's called foliar monitoring. And this is basically just sweep netting. Um, so taking your net and kind of um, getting an insect net, it's pretty low tech, and just sweeping through um, the foliage of plants. Um, and then it can be a little tricky because then you're going to take what's in that net and either look down inside the net and try to see what you're looking at or dump everything out on a big piece of white paper where you can, you know, see the insects really clearly and try to figure out what you're looking at before they crawl or fly away. Um, so it can be tricky, but keep in mind, you're not trying to identify everything that you see. You're only trying to identify the specific insects in the protocol. So that's a little bit more limited. Um, sometimes people get really caught up in like, ooh, what is that? And it's cool to try to figure it out. But if it's not in the protocol, um, you know, in theory, you don't have to worry about it. We're really trying to focus on looking for very specific insects. You can even use um, what's called a beat sheet, um, which is either a big white um, sheet in a frame or even just a small white piece of paper on top of a clipboard. And in those cases, you would shake or tap the foliage onto the paper or um, sheet. Um, so it's pretty similar, but you get, you'll see more insects if you can sweep net. So sweeping your net through the foliage and seeing what you catch. This is the best way to do it to get the um, most amount of data. And then you just basically record all the insects you see and then you release them and let them go or they'll fly away on their own. Um, so I, just as with the floral monitoring, there's some specific information that the protocol protocol has for the foliar monitoring, like how to set up the transect and when to do it. And, um, you know, just some, some helpful tips um, like that. Um, and as with the um, floral monitoring, the foliar monitoring has a specific data sheet that goes along with it that's included in the guide um, where it calls out the specific insects you're looking for. And again, these are insects that we talked about in the presentation today. Um, and there is some overlap. You will look for some of the same insects in both the foliar and the floral monitoring protocol. Um, for example, like lady beetles, because they so feed on nectar as well as preying on other insects. So you would be equally likely to see some of them either visiting flowers or just crawling around on the foliage. Um, so there's some overlap. Uh, but again, we're looking for things where we would expect to find them so that we have some sense of what their populations are like in the landscape. And then the last part of this protocol is the aphid mummy monitoring. So I talked a lot about already about how to recognize mummies. So you, this only works, obviously, if you have an aphid outbreak. This can be a really great exercise especially if you are growing um, crops, anything in the Brassicaceae family, for example, where aphids are you're almost guaranteed to have some kind of aphid outbreak, um, to take the leaves and look on the underside of the leaves and just count, look for pair signs of parasitism. And you're just really straightforward. You're just counting how many parasitized insects that you see so that you know if you've got, you know, these parasites, um, parasitic wasps in your landscape, really good thing to know if they're there, um, you know, uh, trying to manage your aphid population for you. And then lastly, again, um, baseline or monitoring control sites. These are ways who, if mo this protocol is most useful where you're comparing um, your data sets um, to either um, baseline, so either pre-project monitoring and then implementing a project, whether it's habitat or some other changes, and then post project monitoring again and comparing those data. If you're not able to do that, you can find a control site and do side-by-side -side, um, parallel monitoring. And so this protocol kind of talks about how to set up a you know, control site and what to just what to think about when you're when you're choosing a control site so that you're getting good, um, useful, useful data. And then lastly, because people always ask, um, they want to kind of know, okay, which insects prey on which pests. So it has this really simple table with the pictures of the insect um, and then a list of the, of the crop pests that it usually or generally preys upon. Um, one thing, you'll, there's a lot of overlap. Um, you'll probably notice that almost everything eats aphids, which is good news for people who struggle with aphids. 
Um, but you know, it can be sort of useful if you want to think about being like a little bit targeted. Um, and again, I'll just leave this slide up and then we can move into Q and A, but basically um, there we have, um, Xerxes has a lot of information on our website. And in addition to the scouting guide that I talked about today, um, this book, Farming with Native Beneficials, includes tons of information, including what we didn't talk much about today, which are the plants, which plants should you plant to attract these different beneficial insect groups. So that is um, all in this book. Um, and then um, we also have this habitat planning book here, um, which kind of covers a little bit more about on um, the habitat end of things. What do you want to think about if you're creating habitat for beneficials and, you know, what kind of pest management, um, what kind of changes might you want to make in your um, pesticide use so that you're protecting your beneficials, things like that. Um, really useful guide. So I'm going to stop there. And I'm gonna open it up. I think Liz is gonna try to go through the questions and um, ask some of the questions that people have. Yeah, thank you, Jessa. Great presentation as always. Um, we've got a lot of really good questions here. I think we should have time to get through them all. Um, I just wanna note again, if for any reason we don't get to your question or you've got other questions that come up later today, um, please email us at pollinators at xerces.org. And I put that in the chat and you can also find it on our contact page and we'll be able to respond with um, specific advice. All right, so the first question is, I'd also add, or they're wondering if you can discuss um, some tips for differentiating between different kinds of ants and wasps. Um, let's see. Ooh, that's a really good question. Um, I think a body shape, again, is going to be your best bet. So wasps, and ants and wasps are pretty closely genetically um, related, so it can be hard to differentiate. Um, but I think looking for that really um, pinched waist, that pinched abdomen where the where the thorax and abdomen comes together on a wasp, um, and the very kind of um, more narrow overall body of a wasp will help you uh, differentiate it from an ant. Um, and to some extent, behavior to, you know, wasps you'll see visiting flowers to sip nectar. You will not see ants doing that. Um, so that can also be uh, a helpful way to differentiate. Excellent. Thanks, Jessa. Um, and we've got a few questions here about lady beetles. Um, so this one asks, are non-native lady beetles also good generalist predators of native pests? Um, they are. Uh, both native and non-native lady beetles can be very good natural enemies or good predators of crop pests. We don't have a lot of data on comparison, um, you know, which ones are more effective or efficient. One thing, though, that I will say is that, unfortunately, um, the non-native non lady beetles do tend to dominate the native lady beetles and sort of outcompete them. And so out in the landscape, just naturally, we're gonna see a lot more of the non-natives, which is unfortunate. And it, it is kind of having a negative impact on the, um, on the native populations. And that is one of the reasons among others that for all of this work, my recommendation to people is to create the habitat and let the insects kind of come to you. We really don't recommend, generally speaking, purchasing and releasing insects. Um, the lady beetles are a perfect example. People were mass rearing the non-native one um, and releasing it, which is good for pest management, but kind of hammered the native populations. Um, so there can be some caveats to that. I'm not completely opposed um, to people purchasing and releasing insects. There's times that it can be appropriate, can certainly be better than using pesticides a lot of times, um, especially if you're a commercial producer. Um, but just be cautious and make sure you do your homework and know what you're releasing. And um, if possible, there are insectaries that rear native natural enemies, and that would always be my top choice is to is to look for the natives to release if you're gonna if you're gonna go that route. But best case scenario, you're just creating the habitat and not using, you know, and minimizing pesticide use and attracting those beneficials that are already out there um, into your landscape. 
Thanks, Jessa. Uh, we had a few questions about that, so that's a good question. Um, okay, next question is, how far do native bees range from their nesting sites? That's a great question. Um, and so the short answer, um, like all good scientists, I will say it depends. Um, and really, it, it, one of the things it depends on is the size of the bee, which is, I guess, not surprising. The larger bees will travel much further than small bees. Um, also, more social bees like bumblebees or honeybees um, will travel much further um, than our solitary uh, bees, like a, a you know a sweat bee or sunflower bee. We we can say reliably, just from a lot of the data we've collected overall on a very general scale, even the smallest bees seem to travel you know pretty reliably about at least three to four hundred meters. Um, from their nest site out into the landscape. Um, so, you know, what is that? Like six to 900 feet um, between the nesting area and, you know, where they're going to be seen um, foraging. Um, bumblebees will can often be seen up to a kilometer away um, from their nest sites out in foraging and honeybees can be seen even several miles between where their hive is and where they're out foraging. You know, so that if people are trying to kind of create habitat um, around cropped areas, you know, the closer, the better. Um, but, you know, I've kind of done some of the math and if you had like a 10 acre block and you had habitat ringing all the way around that 10 acre block, you're gonna have pretty good sort of ecosystem services or pest management services from the outside of that block all the way into the middle. Um, just because of the movement of those insects. But if you have a hundred acre block and you do that, they're not gonna go all the way into the middle. So um, yeah, scale does matter. All right, and we'll transition from that to another bee question. Are native bees substantially more beneficial pollinators than honeybees? Hmm. That's a great question. Um, and again, I'll say like it, it depends, right? It depends on the crop or what it is that they're pollinating. Native bees do tend to have a strong preference for native plants, which makes sense, right? Because they co-evolved together. Um, and so in natural ecosystems, um, I would say native bees probably are better pollinators, right? Because they're going to go after those, they're going to be pollinating and visiting enthusiastically and visiting those native plants much more so than uh, introduced plants. Honeybees, um, because they're not native, often, I mean, it's really variable that sometimes will show a preference for non-native plants. Um, but there's, you know, there's a lot of, um, like I said, there's a lot of variables. Um, and there's a lot of exceptions to that rule. So it does kind of, it does kind of depend. And then if we're talking about crops, um, there are some crops that uh, native bees are more efficient and effective pollinators of either because they prefer that crop um, or the, their foraging technique is such that they're better pollinators of that crop. Um, or because of this season. So I'm trying to think of a few examples for, for like a tomato, for example, bumblebees are fabulous pollinators of tomatoes because they can, um, what's called sonicate, they can vibrate their bodies really fast and knock all the pollen down from a tomato plant down into their um, uh, bodies where they can you know, catch it and gather it. Honeybees don't have the ability to do that at all. Um, so honeybees really can't pollinate tomatoes. Um, almonds are another example. Native bees, are, there's some orchard, what they call orchard bees or osmia, which are great pollinators of um, a lot of orchard crops, almonds, cherries, apples. Not only do those bees show sometimes a stronger preference for the pollen of those flowers as compared to honeybees, um, but they're also more efficient foragers and they also tend to be more active in cooler temperatures as compared to honeybees. So they can actually be in some ways better or more effective or more efficient. But when we're talking about crop production, I would never suggest, I don't think that, that you know, native bees are gonna somehow replace honeybees. I think we're always gonna need honeybees in those systems, um, but it is really great to have both 
groups of bees kind of around and out there. Um, so yeah, I know that doesn't completely answer the question because again, it, it really depends, but those are some sort of generalities, which I hope, um, I hope that at least partially answers the question. Thanks, Jessa. Um, all right, next question still on the bee topic. Do you recommend installing bee and pollinator hotels? I've heard various opinions. Some say that they provide good habitat. Others say they may create habitat sinks. That's a great question and we get that one a lot. Um, I think those bee hotels are really useful for educational purposes. So they're really fun because you can see, it's very really easy to see that a bee has moved in and is using um, one of those little bee hotels. So I would not be opposed to putting, you know, one or two up, um, you know, a few small ones on your landscape, just because it's easier to, to, to find the bees. You can see them that way. It's really, it's really cool. But as a person question, is there a potential for those bee hotels to be a sink? And yes, there is because those bee hotels, especially the larger ones, or especially if you're trying to do it on a really large scale, think of it like a high rise apartment building. You're like, can putting a whole lot of insects really close together in a really small space. Um, and the, um, the likelihood of disease is spreading. And, you know, honeybees are already really struggling with a lot of diseases um, and, and other pests. So putting a lot of them together really closely, you get really high buildup um, of those um, pest insects. And I'm sorry, I know I just said honeybees. This is, I, I misspoke. Bees in general struggle with a lot of, um, there's a lot of things that are pests of bees. And so putting too many together in too small an area, you can have a lot of, um, of pest problems, things that will actually prey on the bees themselves or disease problems. So what I recommend is again, like one or two bee hotels is fine. You really wanna provide lots of nesting habitat Things like, um, you know, logs and brush piles and pithy stemmed plants, uh, making sure that you have some undisturbed ground for the ground nesting bees. Those are all much better methods generally of getting um, good bee populations um, than putting up a lot of bee hotels. Thanks, Jessa. And um, we have a great guide on nesting habitat and I just put that link in the chat as well. Oh, thanks Liz. Yeah, that guide I think is really helpful. All right, um, question about the guide, the scouting guide itself. Can we use the methods in the scouting guide to monitor planted pollinator gardens or should they only be used for farms and natural areas? Mm, great question. So they are actually applicable to any landscape and we tried to kind of set them up that way, recognizing that people might be using them on huge farms or in small backyards or anything in between. So when it talks about laying out the transects in that guide, it kind of gives you some different options for laying out transects in smaller spaces versus larger spaces, but you should be able to use the same protocol in any kind of landscape and, and get good, valuable data. Excellent. And another question is, I noticed the data sheet does not include spiders and other insects. Is knowing what other species are present um, valuable information? I think, I hope, unless I accidentally put the wrong version up, but hopefully one of the vegetative monitoring or the foliar monitoring should be, um, should have spiders listed um, as one of the insects. And yeah, as I mentioned at the beginning of the guide or at the beginning of the talk, there are so many more beneficial insects than I, than I, than I talked about today or than are in that guide. And so, so many. So, um, we just try to focus on ones that would be relatively easy for people to recognize. And obviously we left a lot out. So one thing that people can do if, if there's other beneficials that they, that they know of and they already know what they look like, like you can just take that data sheet and add your own insects and keep counts of them too, because yeah, it is really val valuable. Um, we are just trying to keep it accessible to as many people as possible. Um, so we could have limited the numbers of insects that we were looking for or looking at. Great. Um, and here's a question similar to monarchs. I know we're getting a lot of monarch questions these days. Um, do, do normally beneficial insects also eat monarch eggs? And is that detrimental to that population? Ah, that's a great question. Um, probably. There are some of these natural enemies or natural predators that would eat monarch eggs. I think one of the really tricky things 
um, about beneficial and, and um, you know, especially generalist predators is that they don't differentiate between, you know, the pest insects that you want to get rid of and the insects that you really um, want to preserve, like the monarchs. Um, so I know that, for example, tachinid flies in some areas are a really big problem um, because they specifically go after uh, monarchs. I can't remember if it's the monarch egg or larva um, that they attack, um, but it's, you know, it's an issue, whereas in some agricultural systems, tachinid flies are also really good pest management. Um, so I think, you know, knowing how, what kind of declines monarchs are experiencing, um, one thing that's really important to know is that you will only see monarch caterpillars or monarch eggs on milkweed. Milkweed is the host plant for a monarch. Um, it's the only place that a female will lay her eggs um, and that it's the only thing that a larva can feed on. So if you're worried about some of these natural enemies kind of going after your monarch eggs or larva or whatever, I would say just protect your milkweed plants directly would be probably the best strategy. Excellent. Thanks, Jessa. Um, next question is, I've seen forward flies attacking bees at my milkweed. My husband kills the flies with a swatter. Is this a good idea or not? Um, I mean, I think given the extreme population declines among monarchs, it's probably a good thing to protect the caterpillars and eggs that we do see. Um, I, I don't think that you could do enough damage to the overall fly population with a fly slaughter, you know, to really cause any, any serious damage. Um, but I certainly wouldn't go out there and start poisoning my, you know, my flies to protect the monarchs. I tend to be a little bit more hands off. So, you know, I mean, I think just trying to keep them again, like trying to keep them off of your milkweed plant or trying to find some way to actually protect that plant, whether it's, you know, netting the plant, for example, or, um, you know, something of that nature, maybe it would be, uh, you know, some kind of physical exclusion um, that actually might be the most effective strategy, but I'll have to really give some more thought on that, like specifically, because we have been getting a lot of questions about that. And this is relatively new for me to really be thinking about specifically about pests of monarchs and how to, how to balance wanting to have natural enemies around with wanting to protect monarch butterflies, so. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, next question. How can we better support grass carrying wasps? They build nests in my window tracks and the nests are destroyed when we have to raise and lower the storm windows. Mm. Um, so I think a lot of, depending on the type of wasp, um, but generally speaking, having, I mean, it is unfortunate because sometimes insects will nest like not where you want them <laughs> and you would really prefer they nest elsewhere and there's not too much you can do about it. But providing at least the right types of nesting habitat can be really helpful. Um, so providing things, just providing a lot of good structure um, in your landscape, like having um, bunch grasses or low growing shrubs, um, having, um, you know, leaving some grass, some leaf piles, um, I'm sorry, not leaving some grass, that didn't make sense, leaving, having some leaf piles, um, leaving some um, logs, uh, rock piles, things like that. That is all good nesting habitat for a lot of different types of insects, including wasps. Um, and so just providing alternate places for them to build their nests so that you're not having, you know, to destroy their nests when you, you know, change out your storm windows or um, whatever. And, you know, obviously a lot of people prefer not to have wasps nesting next to their patio where they might be eating. So, you know, that's understandable. So just trying to provide alternate places for nesting is, is probably your best strategy. Excellent, thanks, Jessa. Um, next question. People used to buy mantid egg cases for garden pest control. We have we now have plenty of voracious Chinese mantids in our gardens, which each eat butterflies, bees, and I have even heard hummingbirds. 
what would you recommend? Do we actively need to control these species? Yeah, this is a really tough one. Mantids um, can be great predators, um, but as this um, person has indicated, they are introduced and they've really become a pest in and of themselves. Um, which is unfortunate because mantids are also sort of sometimes for a lot of people like what I call the gateway insect. It's the insect people get really fascinated with that draws them into the world of insects, which can be a really good thing. Um, and they can be good, um, they can be good pest control, but the problem is that they eat so many other beneficials and they dominate areas um, to such an extent that I generally feel like it's not great to have a lot of them around. Um, I don't know how, I, I mean, I, I don't feel like I should advise people to, you know, go, if they see the larva, like go and crush, you know, or the egg cases to go and crush them. I mean, I'm certainly, you certainly could do that. You can remove, um, I think if you have like a, such a high population that you're worried about them out competing other insects that you could go out, you know, and, and remove the eggs, um, before they hatch. Um, or something like that for, for the mantids to keep their population a little bit under control because they will, they will prey on lots of other beneficials. Um, but on the flip side, like I have mantids in my yard and their population has never gotten high to the point where I feel like I need to do anything about it. And I, I think my overall philosophy, I tend to be, I tend to advise people to be as hands off as they can. Um, and again, just providing like lots of the right kind of habitat, lots of good nectar plants, places to nest, um, not using pesticides or really limiting pesticide use, depending on what your landscape is and what's realistic for you. Those are the kinds of things that I recommend that will probably result in a balanced, healthy ecosystem, regardless of what individual insects are out there. That does tend to be my philosophy overall. Thanks, Jessa. Um, next question is, um, if you have recommendations on the type or quality of hand lens for this type of scouting. Oh, goodness. Um, I do and I can't think of it right now, what magnification level, and it's changed, it's interesting, it's changed for me as I've gotten older, uh, and my eyesight has gotten worse. <laughs> So I swapped out my hand lenses and I need a little more magnification than I used to. Um, so I know, for example, like a lot of the um, materials that we use, um, we purchase from um, places like BioQuip or others, you know, places that provide um, uh, science, scientific materials. Um, and you know, I think for the hand lens, trying a couple different ones out and seeing what works for your eyes also matters whether or not you wear glasses, whether you're going to wear glasses when you're out there scouting. So I would do something like maybe um, use it to look at some of the freckles on your backside of your hand or something and see if it magnifies that freckle enough. Because, you know, if you think about it, you want to be using that hand lens to see um, the, the smallest insect we're talking about is a minute pirate bug, which is, you know, a couple millimeters. So they're going to be pretty small, um, but you're not looking at things that are completely microscopic. And I have made the mistake of buying a, a hand lens that magnifies too much. Um, and then it's, it's almost impossible to see what you're looking at because it's, it's over magnifying. So you might kind of want to go to an actual place where you can try them out and look at them. And sort of, yeah, look at little moles or freckles on your body and, and, and use that as a sort of guide um, to see if you've got the right amount of uh, magnification. Excellent. Thank you. Um, okay, next question here is, um, this person is wondering if we have specific recommendations for how much uh, insect and pollinator habitat is needed relative to a certain crop or a certain crop field. Um, so they're wondering if we have, you know, specifications for how much habitat to put in per acre. Unfortunately, we don't. Uh, and part of the reason is because, of course, again, it just comes back to that question of like, it depends. Like, are we talking about pest management or are we talking about pollination? What crop are we talking about? Um, how bad are your pest outbreaks? Like, there's so many variables that it is almost impossible to answer that question, which I know isn't super helpful to people. Um, the rule of thumb that we like to use 
Um, and this kind of feeds into some of our other programs. Like we have a certification program called Be Better Certified. Um, and with that program and with our general recommendations, we, we generally recommend, so if we're talking about like an agricultural landscape or a crop, a crop uh, landscape, we recommend at least 5% of your total land be in some kind of natural habitat. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna get full pollination services from your adjacent crop or that you're gonna get full pest control. It's really just a good realistic goal for people to use. Um, Again, in terms of scale, as I mentioned, the distance that these insects will travel, you do want to think about that. And so it can be good to have your sort of your habitat interspersed throughout your cropped areas, for example, um, so that you're getting those insects moving out from your, your little habitat area out into the crops. But the big caveat with that is, of course, it depends what you're doing in the cropped areas that, you know, sort of putting habitat out in the middle of cropped areas can work very well if you're very judicious with your pesticide use. Um, but if that's not gonna work for you and if you use pesticides that could be harmful to pollinators or beneficials, then you don't wanna do that. Then you want your habitat a little bit set back and protected. So, you know, my, my advice would be for people in, in an agricultural setting, you know, to try to get that 5% of your land and habitat if it's at all possible. Um, and, um, you know, the more, the better. Excellent. Thanks, Jessa. And I know sometimes I tee you up with a trick question, so I apologize, but that was great. <laughs> um, all right. We've got about two minutes left. Going to see if we can get a few more questions in here. Um, the next one is what's the difference between wasps and hornets? So a hornet is a type of wasp. A uh, yellow jacket is a type of wasp. A hornet is like a type of wasp, a paper wasp. Those are all within the wasp, um, within um, the family of wasps, they're just different types of wasps. And a hornet is kind of actually, generally speaking, just a generic term that could be applied to almost any wasp. So yeah, there's a lot of confusion in the wasp family. And um, as I said, yellow jackets, which people talk about a lot, are a specific type of wasp. I don't know if people have ever heard the term meat bee. I don't think people use that term too much anymore but um, they did a lot in my day. And a meat bee actually is the same thing as a yellow jacket, which is a type of wasp. Important to remember bees are not carnivorous. They're not gonna go after your hamburger. So if you're at a picnic and something is trying to get your burger, it's probably a wasp, it's probably a yellow jacket. Great, um, thank you, Jessa. And that just about puts us at time. And I know we did have a few other questions in here that we didn't get to. Um, so again, I encourage everyone, um, you can email us at pollinators at xerces.org. Um, and that email is available on our contact page. Um, and we would love to answer any more questions for you. Um, but that is all the time we have for today. Thank you again so much for joining us. And Jessa, if you have any parting words, I'll hand it off to you. Um, I just want to thank everybody for, you know, taking the time to, to join us today to talk about this. It's obviously something I'm really excited about. Um, I know that a lot of people have sort of webinar fatigue. It's been a long year of <laughs> lots of webinars and not enough in person. Um, so my hope for all of you who join me today is that um, sometime in 2021, we'll all be able to get out there in the field and do this together in person. Um, but until then, thank you so much for joining us today. And um, yeah, I hope this was informative and useful. So thanks, everybody.